Because if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. Don't be afraid to try something new. And don't be afraid to take a risk. If all you're going to do as an analyst is uh, come up with your statistical reports, that's fine. The strategic stuff is fine. A lot of analysts are still stuck with that. Why? Because it's safe. It's easy to predict the past. It's not so easy to do the future. What's going on analysts? Welcome to the channel where we talk about all things crime analysis. In this video, I'll be speaking with Steve Gottlieb, who many consider one of the pioneers in crime analysis. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm in Chicago at the IACA conference and had the opportunity to interview an old friend, Steve Gottlieb. Most analysts know Steve from taking his crime analysis applications course. I asked Steve to talk to me about how he got started in crime analysis, the IACA, and some words of wisdom. And here's how it went. It's a story, it's a story. Uh, I always tell people that I've been hanging around police stations since I was 14 years old. Because I started with West Covina Police Department, which is a suburb of Los Angeles, as a police explorer scout. And I really, really enjoyed it. And uh, it came time when I was 18 years old that I was able to apply for a position as a police cadet. And at 18 years old, it was a full-time position, 40-hour week and so on. And you took the same test to be a police cadet as you would a police officer, including the oral and the physical and the oral interviews and psychological and so on and so forth. And the way that that worked back then is that, you know, uh, assuming that uh, you liked the job and they liked you and you had done a good job by the time you were 21 years old, they would automatically swear you in as a police officer. And so that's what happened. So I went from being a full-time police cadet to a full-time police officer and uh, attended the academy at uh, Riverside Sheriff. And I stayed with West Covina for probably about four to five years, and I loved the department. It was really, really good. But West Covina Police Department was a young police department, and like a lot of municipalities, uh, we only had just a very few sergeants, couple lieutenants, captains, so on and so forth. And the chances for advancement weren't really all that great. I mean, I love the department, I love the people. The chief was absolutely wonderful to me. But uh, I started looking at L.A. County Sheriff's Department because with L.A. Sheriff, they have just a, a tremendous variety of assignments. I mean, things that municipalities would never, never do. Everything from horses to helicopters and everything in between. And so I decided that uh, because of that, I also wanted to, plus the fact too, that when they would make sergeants, they'd make 200 all at the same time. So your chances for promotion were really pretty good. So as it turned out, uh, I did leave West Covina Police Department, went to work for the Sheriff's Department. And uh, like everybody that transfers over to LA Sheriff, you have to go to the jail first. So I spent 19 months in jail, and I was lucky, I got out early. You know, we used to say that the prisoners had it better than we did, because at least they had a release date. We oftentimes never knew. But because I had been a lateral entry and had done my time on the streets in patrol and everything else like that, I uh, was able to get out pretty pretty quickly and I went to work in the King's Palace, the Hall of Justice, which is where the sheriff was, and I had transferred into one of his administrative units taking care of the sheriff's department's grants, a lot of state grants and federal grants and so on and so forth. And that went on for several years. And uh, I had uh, eventually taken the sergeant's test and uh, I came out number 17. Uh, on the sergeant's exam and it was only a short time after that that I decided to quit and the reason that I decided to quit is because I had a friend of mine that owned a travel agency and he asked me if I would go to work for him. The thing behind that is that I had had quite a music background. Most people are not aware of the fact that I'm a piano player and I also play trombone and uh, originally I thought that I always wanted to be a high school band teacher. But when I started taking music over at Cal State Fullerton, I got very disenchanted with the faculty. There's a lot of people with a lot of egos and so on and so forth. And I just didn't enjoy being around those kind of folks. But because of my music background, when I was 18 years old, I had been uh, chosen by the School Band of America to uh, go to Europe, playing concerts over in Europe with a group of kids, 300 of them, put together from all over the United States. And I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. 
And one thing had led to another, and I had met this particular gentleman who then asked me if I would start taking tours, picking up bands and choirs across the country and taking them to Europe, and I did. And so for the time I was at the Sheriff's Department, that's what I would do on my vacations. I would pick up these bands and choirs, take them to Europe. And I had the opportunity then to buy a travel agency, which I set up on the campus of California State University, Los Angeles. So uh, I got out of the business, and I had that travel agency for about three years, and I just did not find it as fulfilling as law enforcement. You know, helping Mrs. Smith plan her vacation to Hawaii was just not as exciting as law enforcement and the things that we get involved with uh, in cases and so on and so forth. So consequently, as it happened, uh, I had moved out to the Chino area and I was driving down the street one day and I happened to stop at a light and I looked at the guy next to me, he stopped in the car and it was a buddy of mine from uh, West Covina. We had been baby cops together and he was now chief of police of the Chino Police Department. And so it was one of those things, you know, hey, pull over, pull over. And so I did and we got to talking and he said, you know, uh, I've got a council meeting tonight and I'll be out early at seven o'clock. Why don't you come on over and uh, we'll put on some coffee and kind of catch up and that's exactly what happened. And as it turned out, he had recently received a grant from the state of California to develop a crime analysis unit. And it was a new program called the CCAP program, which was the Career Criminal Apprehension Program. That was a state program that came out of the governor's office there in California. And uh, so he said, you know, would you think maybe about coming to work? Well, I don't know, you know, I've got the travel agency and I do enjoy it, but you know, and he capped after me, you know, well, at least test for the position. You know, you don't have to take the job, but just test for it. Well, things work out in strange ways. Shortly after that, a man happened to show up on my doorstep who was looking to buy a travel agency. And so he and I put together a sale and that left me free to go uh, on with Jim. And uh, the interesting thing about it was though, I took the test and I came out number two. And Jim said, um, gee, Steve, I'm really sorry, but you know, they did the oral and there's a woman in Rhode Island and she did a telephone interview, but she had been with a federal ICAP program, the Integrated Criminal Apprehension Program, and they really liked the experience she had, and so I play the game straight. I mean, you're a good friend, but you know, you came in number two. And so I said, okay, well, that's the way that it goes. And fortunately, the sale of the agency hadn't quite gone through yet. So I go back to thinking, well, I guess I'm gonna keep my travel agency for a while. And a week later, Jim calls me back and he said, well, you want the job? It's yours. I said, well, I thought that they were going to hire this other lady. Well, <laughs> they were. Turns out she had a brother that lived in Santa Monica, California, and she was going to come and she was going to live with him when she worked for Chino. Now, that's a heck of a drive from Santa Monica to Chino, but you know, you can't ask about things like that. So uh, fine. Well, as it turned out, a couple days later, the poor guy stepped off of a curb, got mowed down by a car, and now he's dead. So now she doesn't have uh, the brother out here. And so she tells Jim, well, sorry, I'm gonna turn down the job. That's when he picked up the phone and said, you're back. And so I said, okay, fine. She called back the week after that saying, I changed my mind, you know, I want the job. And well, sorry, it's already filled. So that's how I got started with that. And uh, I was working for a lieutenant at the time, and he had no idea about grants and the reports and everything. Well, I'd been doing all that kind of stuff at the sheriff's department. So I said, would you like me to take this over? And he said, yes, please do. And so I did. And so I ended up hiring two other analysts and I had myself a, an admin secretary and so on and so forth. And uh, in the process of working on this grant, the state sent its monitors down. And these people look at what you're doing and seeing what is, what's going on and what kind of procedure you use and so on. And they seemed to like what we were doing there at Chino. And so uh, they asked me if I would start presenting at some of their conferences. You know, the grantees, the other people who had the uh, grants and so on, they would go to the conferences and we'd talk about things and they said, you know, we'd like you to show them what you've been doing. Well, anybody who's been to my classes knows I can't do anything straight. I gotta use a little comedian, gotta use a little humor, got a little little magic, you know, because I've always been a ham bone. I've told people that, you know, if I had a chance to get uh, on a Broadway stage, I'd probably give this up tomorrow. Because as a kid, 
I did little theater. I also, uh, most people are not aware of the fact that I was a radio disc jockey and I had my own radio show uh, from two to six in the afternoon and that was when I was 16 years old in high school. After school I'd come over and that's a whole other story. But anyway, uh, I said sure, I will be happy to present and so I did and people seemed to like the presentations that I was doing and at one of them there was a fellow there from the California Department of Justice and he said, you know, I would really like you to do these seminar type things four times a year all around different parts of the state and my buddy Jim, the chief, he was very good about letting me go and so I started doing those seminars there and then uh, I quickly kind of came to the conclusion, you know, if I'm going to do this, there should be some sort of written material to go along with it. And so I wrote the textbook, uh, you know, Crime Analysis from Concept to Reality with Sheldon Ehrenberg. Sheldon was a senior, a, a senior trainer uh, consultant for the California Department of Justice and they had teamed us together. Uh, I mean, when I first took Sheldon's class, it was a criminal intelligence class, the guy was amazing. I mean, his stories were just, uh, um, and I can do a whole section on him, how he started with the mafia in the 1950s and got into it, then got out of it and into the Israeli underground, and then CIA, and I mean, geez, fascinating guy. But he was my mentor for all of the math type stuff. And so we were teaching there, and so uh, we wrote the book, and the state published 50 copies for all of the grantees, you know. And we said, okay, that's fine, but now what? You know, uh, are you gonna continue to print more copies? And they said, no, we, we don't have the budget for it. So I said, okay, well, if you guys don't mind then, I'm gonna take the book and, you know, we'll distribute it on our own. So it had taken me about two and a half years to write that book, but it finally came out. And it wasn't too long after that, probably, I guess, around 1994, 95, that I got a call from the FBI. And how they found me, I don't know. I still don't know to this day, but they did. And they called me and they said, we hear that, uh, you know, you teach classes, yes, and you have this textbook, yes. Well, we're looking to form a three-week training class here at the FBI Academy, and we would like you to be on our committee to help put this thing together. So I said, okay, fine. And again, my buddy Jim, you know, he was very supportive. So he let me go. They didn't pay me, but at least they pay your expenses, you know. And so I went back to Quantico, to the academy, and helped them put that together. And then they asked me if I'd start teaching it for the NA, the National Academy. And so I started to do that. And then I guess it was probably about uh, 94, 95, at about that same time, I happened to get a call from a fellow by the name of Skip Baylor from the Montgomery County Department of Police in uh, Rockville, Maryland. And he said, um, I have just been promoted to crime analysis supervisor. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. I don't know what my people are supposed to do. But I've been calling around and I talked to the FBI and they said, you have a class. And I said, yeah, I do. And he said, well, could you bring that class out here? And that was the first time I then traveled under my own banner. I had to come up with a name for the company and I called it the Alpha Group Center for Crime and Intelligence Analysis. Don't ask me how, don't ask me why. I still don't think it was the best name, you know, but it stuck. And so I had 30 people there. And the class went very, very well. And from that class, uh, people, hey, can you do one for us in Virginia? Can you do it for us down in Collier County, Florida? You know, uh, Honolulu, Hawaii, Little Rock, Arkansas. Well, as things happened, uh, it was in the mid-1990s or so that we started having a bad recession out in California. And um, I won't go through the whole detail of the thing, but suffice it to say that there was a big layoff. Now, when I had gone over to Jim, he had brought me over as a Bureau Commander, Special Services Bureau, and I had the Crime Analysis, Serious Habitual Offenders, Career Criminal Apprehension Program, DARE Program, and Crime Prevention. But even though it was a Bureau Commander spot, it was as a civilian. And so uh, when this layoff came about, all of us who were middle managers, uh, we, we got led the, uh, even the chief's admin assistant, she was let go, the emergency operations center guy, records bureau guy was let go. Uh, we had uh, sergeant reduced down to corporal, corporal to police officer, two police officers uh, lost their job. I mean, it was a real bloodbath. So anyway, uh, and this happened right around Thanksgiving night. And I had just bought a house and closed escrow on it two weeks before. 
I had been leasing my car and the five-year lease was up and I had just gotten a new car uh, a week ago. And my first day in my new house, having gone from being a $700 renter to a $1,700 homeowner, first day was the day after Thanksgiving and I remember sitting in my house thinking, now let's see, new house, new car, no job. Income is non-existent, expenses are way up. Houston, we have a problem. But fortunately, after that, I had had already booked uh, the uh, Florida Department of Justice, and I had about 30 people in that. So the layoff was effective in November, and the next month I had the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Then in January, I got a call from uh, the uh, Virginia Department of Criminal Justice Services. I'd been talking to a fellow who had been interested in hosting the courses, who called me in December and he said, uh, well, when do you think we should do the seminar? I thought now it'd be ducky, you know, <laughs> considering that I don't have any income. So I booked him for January. And uh, then he also said, okay, why don't we do it twice? We'll do it in January and October. So that gave me an October date. And then uh, I had, um, my last date with the California Department of Justice in February. Okay, so I came back from that in February of 96 and I had nothing. I had no job and I had only the one thing lined up for you know January and October. But when I uh, had written that book, uh, a fellow by the name of Bill Tafoya, an FBI profiler, had done me a very big favor. He had done a review of my book and he had put that review in the FBI Law Enforcement Bulletin, which of course goes around the world, right? And uh, so uh, at that time when that came out, I was on vacation. I didn't know it until I got back that he had done that. And so I opened up my copy of it, and to my horror, they had put the wrong telephone number in there for that book. And I thought, oh my God. So I quickly called the number and I said, hello, my name is Steve Gottlieb and I had written a book and it was reviewed in the FBI Law Enforcement Bulletin. And I'm just wondering, you know, had anybody called you? Had you received any calls on it? And he said, you don't want to know. I said, that many, huh? He said, yeah, and he says, I'm so sorry. He said, I had no knowledge of you or that people keep calling me asking me about this book. I didn't know the first thing about it. He said, now though that I know, if anybody calls, I'll tell them. And I thought, how many books could that have been, you know? But anyway, as people had bought them, each time I sent it out, I sent a little postcard with it. Would you like to have free training? If you want free crime analysis training, contact me. And uh, so they did. They started sending in these cards. And uh, I had gotten one from uh, Ottawa Police in Canada, a guy named Graydon Patterson. He ordered five books. And I called him, I said, Graydon, what are you doing? Are you eating these things for breakfast or what? And he said, no, but we're starting this crime analysis program. I've got five analysts and I want to get your book for each one of them. And I said, well, then you need a seminar. And so I set him up. And so he was for uh, November of the following year. And so the bottom line on all of that is uh, I had nothing at the end of February. I was contemplating taking my sign, standing in front of police department saying, we'll analyze for food. <laughs> but uh, I stayed on the phone all of March, uh, call back all those people that sent in the postcards. By the end of March, I was booked for the whole rest of the year and I've never made a cold call since. Never. Since 1996, March of 96, it's all been them, you know. I can't begin to tell you how, how blessed I feel. The good Lord has been good to me. Really watched over me on this little enterprise. And so this have been my life. And that's kind of how we get started in the whole thing. So my first conference, I think, was about 1991. It had been started in 1990, and a fellow by the name of Dale Harris was the president of IACA at the time. And I was doing a presentation in San Diego, California, and he was there. He was also doing a presentation, and that's where we met. And uh, he found out that, you know, I uh, teach the crime analysis classes. And so he invited me to come to uh, IACA, and I did the next year. 
in 91, and then uh, I guess it was probably starting around 1992 that he asked me if I would actually do my presentations. And so I did, I did them for several years here, and then uh, have been a member ever since. And it was, I don't remember exactly how many years ago now that I started this award, probably maybe four to five years ago now. And as I kind of indicated, you know, the profession has been very, very good to me. And I really wanted to do something for it. I know it sounds corny and crazy and pretty hackneyed to say to give back, you know, at this point, but I did. And so that's uh, where I came up with the idea. Now, first, there had been an award that Dale created. It was called the Innovation Award. But then, I don't know, a number of years ago, maybe it was health problems or something else, but we have not seen Dale for quite some time. And so that award went away. And I always thought that was a very, very good award. And so I thought, well, I'd like to pick that up again, except I didn't want to go and name the same thing that he had. That wouldn't have been you know, fair to him, I didn't think so. That's why I came up with my own, the Steve Gottlieb Alpha Group Center Award for Creativity and Excellence. And uh, what made this award a little bit different is that you know, a lot of times, a police agency will be recognized for something that it did, or the agency will do something and the chief will get the credit for it. But oftentimes the person who actually did the work came up with the idea is oftentimes never recognized. And so that's what I wanted to change. I wanted to make sure that whoever came up with the idea, whoever put the work in to make it work, receive the recognition and that's why what makes this award a little bit different is that it is awarded to that person individually and these people are typically nominated by their own agencies so they're made aware of the fact that we have this and if you have someone in your agency that has created something that has contributed to better working in the department or something to help mitigate the crime problems then please submit it and then we will give them the award and the award is two thousand dollars it's a check that I make personally payable to the individual. It doesn't go to the department, it doesn't go to the chief, it's made personally payable to that person to recognize them for what they did. The other thing is there is no restriction whatsoever on what it can be used for. If you want to put it as a down payment on a car, if you want to put uh, you know, a patio cover on your patio, God bless you, do whatever you want, but that money is yours. And uh, I love to give it away. I really love to give it away because I think that people really do deserve the recognition that should come with the work that you put into a project that actually does bring a claim to your agency. So that's the purpose of it. I had heard that we had about 600 people here, but I didn't know until just this afternoon when she announced it that about 300 of those people are first timers, you know. Uh, it's really fantastic. You know, nobody here that's watching this can look at the room like I am, but I mean, if you take a look at this room here, I mean, it's a huge room there, and the chairs, I mean, it's been a massive attendance that we've had, and it's been really, really good. And you're right, I mean, after the pandemic and everything else, it's really good to be back. And the enthusiasm that we have is great. Uh, there's a lot of people that uh, I've not met before, which means we've got a lot of people coming up, and the presentations have been very, very good. And you know something? That's another thing. The association, I think, has really embraced a lot of the technology that has been developed for us. And I think that that's really what's helped us. You know, when I started, and I've, I've said this before, so I'm not dating myself, <laughs> at least not newly dating myself. We started with a desk and a yellow pad. And that was it, okay? Uh, even personal computers hadn't come out by that time. And from it to go from that to what it is today is terrific. And really, I think that the technology has really propelled our profession into the future and, and shown a spotlight on it like it never had before. I mean, the very first thing, you know, mapping, that made a big splash. And now everything else that has come along the things with the cell phones and the CDR information. Um, we had a presentation this afternoon just on the use of uh, a $15 floor plan 
for doing graphics for homicides or whatever. I mean, little things like that that we never used to do. Before it would be, okay, take your ruler and your graph paper and make little rectangles and all this kind of stuff. You know, and I, well, okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and say it. I have tremendous regard and respect for the women in our profession. And I'll tell you why. Back then, back when we started with a desk and a yellow pad, and these women would go into an agency. I don't know how they did it. When they came across that 20 year veteran detective, cigar smoking, chomping guy, that would look at them and say, well, you seem like a sweet girl, honey, but what can you do for me? And I had to wonder, what, what can you do for him? Even us guys, you know, what, what, what can we do? But by God, however they did it, they did it. I mean, we have a tremendous amount of women in this profession. And I think that as the profession has grown and we've, we've had more and more innovation and, and more and more technology, that today, if some detective tried to say something like that, what can I do for you? Well, here, let me show you what I can do for you. Can you do this with the mapping? Can you kind of animate, you know, cell phones and see exactly where this guy was knocking off this tower and that tower and the other thing? Do you know how to do that, Mr. Detective? Yeah, there, there are a few things that I can do for you. And so I think God bless them. And I think that, yeah, technology has, I mean, the vendors that we have, are, are they've come up with wonderful, wonderful products for us, you know? Because uh, I remember the days when crime analysts were not held in particularly high regard. You know, at that time, all we were doing were reading reports and we're putting out basically a daily bulletin of the, the addresses where we had the burglaries last night and kind of limited that. So it's really grown, it's really grown. And so I'm excited about the profession. I think we have a lot of good people that are coming up uh, and they're good presenters as well. So I think we've got a, a very, very good future here, you know. I, I'm also really, really impressed with the progress that our association has had, or has made, I guess I should say. Uh, you know that a lot of the products that we see that are coming out of the organization are in Spanish, English, French, and Portuguese, you know. Uh, I, I think that that says a lot. You know, and the number of people that we have here this year that are first timers, but from a lot of different countries. I think, I think they said tonight that uh, we have now just topped 5,000 members in the ICA. okay? I remember when it was just in a couple of hundred. And over the years, it's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And now we have people from all over the world. You know, we have Rachel Carson. I mean, she's committee chair for the whole international group. We never used to need an international coordinator because we didn't have that many people. So I think that uh, we've got a lot of reasons to be very, very proud. I know uh, Mary has done a terrific job as the president uh, and her whole team has done a really, really great job. I think everybody has certainly made themselves uh, feel at home, made other people feel at home. Um, the the whole program, the food, everything, I think has been very, very good. So, yeah, I think that uh, the, the association really deserves a big hand for everything that they've done. I don't remember which pope it was, but supposedly one of them had said about today that our technology has surpassed our humanity. <laughs> and I sometimes wonder if that isn't true. But you know what? Um, I, I agree with you except for the fact that I think that the technology is here to stay. You know, when uh, I would be teaching the classes, some of the things, because very seldom do I have a room where I've got a ton of computers, so that if I got 30 students, you know, everybody's at a computer. So we, tech, we teach techniques, and there are things that we have to do by hand. You know, and I, I get these kind of things, well, why do I have to do this by hand? And I said, because I'm not teaching you how to work with a computer. I'm not, I'm teaching you concepts. I'm teaching you concepts. I'm teaching you the why behind it. And I think what we need to do is to teach these people the reason that they need to know the why, not just doing it. If I may give an example, 
Uh, I've been kidded for years and years and years because I've used that scientific calculator, okay? Uh, and I know it's been associated with me. Annie uh, Mitchell has teased me about that forever, as have a few other people. Uh, let me make a disclaimer that for years now, uh, yeah, I still use it, but I also show them how to do the stuff with Excel, okay? So uh, we, are, we are not that out of date. I still show them how to do the stuff with Excel. But yes, we still use that calculator. And the reason why is this, if I may use an example. All right, Manny, you're a police officer, and you're out on the street. And uh, one night, you arrest a bad guy. And so now you're in court. And uh, the defense attorney says, uh, you know, officer, um, how did it happen that you were in the street that night and you ran into my uh, client? And you say, well, uh, Sally Smith is our crime analyst. And she put out a bulletin and she said that, you know, uh, a good likely time and date uh, and location would be this area here. So, you know, that's where we should be watching for him. And I read her bulletin and I was in the right place at the right time. And that's how he, your client and I met up. Oh, well, how did she know that uh, that was going to be the date, time or location? <laughs> it beats the heck out of me. I think you're going to have to ask her. So the next thing, Sally is on the stand. Uh, Ms. Smith, uh, I understand you put out that bulletin. Yes, I did. Uh, well, how did you know uh, that it was going to be there? Well, I, I put the dates in and, and the times and the locations of his past hits. I put that into uh, the computer and then I pushed the button and that's what the computer said. That's what the computer, yeah. How do you know that you didn't make a mistake? How do you know that it didn't make a mistake? How, how does the computer know to do that? And, and she's sitting there, um, uh, I mean, what, what's going on behind the scenes there, Miss Smith? How does it know? Or telling the same thing to your boss. You know, when you're, when you're even coming up with a forecast for the boss and you tell the boss, this is it because, see, your boss is gonna have to perhaps authorize the overtime and we're gonna have to choose the officers that are gonna be doing that and that's gonna cost us money uh, how do you know, Sally, that this is where it's likely to happen? <laughs> well, boss, that's what the computer said. You need to know why. You need to understand why. And you need to understand what some of the steps are that lead to that process, that lead to that com conclusion. And that's why I show them with the calculator, so that you know what's going on behind the scenes. You know, and so that you can take a look at something and say, that's not right. And look back at you, oh, I transposed that number. I didn't write that one incorrect. Now you know what it should be, why? Because you understand the concepts behind it. And that's the thing sometimes that does, does disturb me because people don't oftentimes want to do that. They want a shortcut. They want to take the, 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 the and, and go right to the, the finish line. Well, okay, that's fine. Well, and why, why can't I take the shortcut? I mean, I've got a machine here that's gonna do it for me. You know, technology is not gonna go backwards. It's gonna continue to go forward. Now, the things that we think are e easy today are probably gonna become even easier tomorrow. And that bothers me because what do you do if you don't have those tools? You know, what happens? You know, for a, for a lot of people, I guess if they had a power outage, they may as well go home. <laughs> you know, all of my tools are gone. My thought has always been, it's human nature. We all want as much as we can get, as fast as we can get it, with the least possible time and at the least possible cost. You know, I don't know if some of the folks may have ever read Jack Canfield's book, uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul. And one of the things that he says about doing something new is if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got, okay? Don't be afraid to try something new. Okay, uh, and don't be afraid to take a risk. I know, you know, in 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, everybody thought the world was flat, right? And you sail off the end of the earth and the monsters are gonna eat you and devour you. And so in 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, if he had to turn back, nobody would have blamed him. But nobody would have remembered him either. You know, yes, if you're gonna come out with forecasts, uh, when and where bad guys are going to strike again, yeah, it is possible you could be wrong, okay? But on the other hand, it's also possible that you could be right. 
If all you're going to do as an analyst is uh, come up with your statistical reports, you know, well, we had a 10% increase in this and a 10% decrease in that, and given a 5% change in our calls for service, that should make a 10% increase in the rest. I mean, that's fine. The strategic stuff is fine. And a lot of, a lot of analysts are still stuck with that. Why? Because it's safe, you know? Uh, it's easy to, <laughs> it's easy to predict the past, you know? It's not so easy to do the future. But that's why I say, you know, some of the greatest joys, I think, come from the fact that you are willing to take that risk. And when they do work out, you know, and they all work out, uh, it's a tremendous feeling of satisfaction. Not only for you, but I think also for the officers that you're giving those predictions to. But it's not going to work out all the time. But nothing is going to work all the time. So, you know, don't be afraid, though, to try something new. Don't be afraid to take the risk. I think that's probably my best advice. That was Steve Gottlieb, retired law enforcement officer, author, crime analysis instructor, and longtime friend. Thanks for checking out this episode from the All About Analysis channel. If you enjoyed this video, smash that like, click subscribe, and hit that bell so you don't miss any of our episodes. See you next time.